journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure, as seen through the eyes of real people. Here to present the actual films of tonight's journey is John Stevenson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, not all of us have the time, the money, or the opportunity to look for action and excitement in foreign lands. But here within the boundaries of our own United States is opportunity for all to search for at least a temporary escape from the hectic pace of everyday living. As proof, we welcome back to our series Mr. Richard Hathcock, who previously in one episode took us from the burning desolation of Death Valley to the peaks of Mount Whitney, and who tonight takes us on a roundup at a huge ranch in Arizona. Tonight's guest guide on the adventure trail, the young man who specializes in journeys within our own United States, like the 100 miles episode of a few months ago, and tonight's roundup in Arizona, Mr. Richard Hathcock. How are you, Mr. Tom. Hathcock? Tom. It's a pleasure to have you back with us again. Very nice to be here. Let's say we step over here, sit down, make ourselves comfortable, and have a little chat. Thank you very much. Now, is there any particular reason, Mr. Hathcock, why you picked the state of Arizona for your film tonight? Why not Montana, Colorado, or Wyoming? Well, it just happens, John, as you'll see in the picture tonight. Uh, we were cleaning out the garage one afternoon and ran into a stack of Arizona Highway magazines. And the pictures of the country and the Indians were so interesting, we decided to go and look at them. So while we were there, uh, we were only a short distance from some friends who own a big ranch in southern Arizona, so we went down there to cover the roundup. Oh, I assume then that your wife went along with you when you said we. That's right, John. I've uh, taken her to the jungles and to the top of Mount Whitney and into the desert, and uh, she goes everywhere with me. Well, wonderful. Let's leave the confines of our studios and get out into the wide open spaces. What do you say? Fine. Our setting is Arizona, and here is Mr. Hathcock to describe the action. Well, John, as I was telling you, Dee and I were cleaning out the garage one afternoon, and we ran into a whole stack of Arizona Highway magazines. And in one of these magazines, we saw a picture of the old Indian ruin of Batadican up in northern Arizona. So we said, what the heck, we've got a little time, let's take off and go see this ruin. So we loaded up the car with some extra water, blankets, other equipment we were going to need, and some canned foods, and we hopped in the jalopy and off we went. From the looks of the equipment, it looks like you're going to do some camping out, is that true? Well, we always camp out, John, whenever we possibly can. We don't like staying inside. And of course, there's lots of country where you can't find an inside place to stay anyhow. So we crossed the Colorado River at Blythe and got into Arizona. And very shortly after crossing into Arizona, we were at the tomb of High Jolly, the old camel tear. You might not know this, John, but at one time the U.S. Army imported camels from Arabia and uh, attempted to set up a camel corps. I think I remember something about that from my high school history. Mm-hmm. And we passed the wreck of a jet plane, which had crashed the day before, uh, as we went further into Arizona, through the drifting alkali dust we passed another denizen of the desert, the Gila monster. Now this is the only lizard in the world which is poisonous. We get up into the Indian country, we begin to see many of the Navajos. These people are nomadic, principally sheep raisers. And most of them have old wagons that they travel around in. Although a few of them have brand new cars. These Indians are doing pretty well now. This is going out to one of the Hogans that the Navajos live in. The entrance to all Hogans is toward the east. Now why is that? To let the spirits of the morning sun into the Hogan. And if a person dies inside the Hogan, he's taken out a hole in the back of the Hogan so that they can meet the spirits of the west. This old Navajo chief has made some moccasins which he's selling to a trader. Dee is quite interested in the cooking that these people do and she picked up several recipes. You can get an idea of the facial characteristics of some of these people. Very cute little girl. I'll say she is. Her mother has made a brush out of some weeds that they find on the reservation there and she keeps the little girl's hair looking very pretty. In the middle of the Navajo reservation is the Hopi town of Orebi. This is the oldest continuously lived-in city in North America. This is old Chief Tua, 
the oldest living Hopi Indian. He's over 100 years old. Many of his great-grandchildren were standing around watching his work here. And he was showing Dee how he still makes Kachina dolls, as he did in his youth. Look at those hands, steady. He's still productive in spite of his old age. He's quite active. Now, these paints, uh, the reds, blues, and yellows, are made from clays which are dug up in the bottom of Grand Canyon. Now, these kachinas are replicas of the spirits of the Hopi world. Another denizen that we found in the deserts up there are some of these burrows. These animals are in a wild state? Well, they're wild, but they're fairly tame, John. Not too difficult to approach. And we finally got into the Batatican country. This is an amazing ruin. The cave is 500 feet in height and 200 yards in depth. It's over 1,400 years old, John. Nearly 1,000 people lived in this cave. It's fantastic. What do you mean by Batican? Batatican, which oh, means hillside house. Mm -hmm. It was chosen principally for its shelter and because it was easy to defend against the marauding tribes of other Indians. It was first discovered by white men in 1909. There are over 150 rooms in this cave. It's red sandstone, which the winds and the water have eroded. Now, you can imagine what a front door this would be to your home. Tremendous. This arch is over 500 feet tall. Now, these people who lived here predated the Navajos. Probably people were living in this cave four or 500 years before Columbus discovered America. Hmm. Even today, although many people have been there, you still find some of the relics. These pots were at least 700 years old. Well, whatever happened to this particular tribe of people? Well, these people moved because the game was hunted out in that area and because the ground became infertile and they couldn't raise crop further. I see. These steps were actually hewn out of the sandstone rock hundreds of years ago by Indians. It's a wild, rugged country. From there, we decided to go back down into southern Arizona, where we'd once been, to a friend's ranch, the Rail X Ranch near Patagonia, Arizona. It's a ranch that's owned by Walter Colby, a very dear friend of mine. And his ranch of 120,000 acres is spread at the foothills of the Santa Rita Range in southern Arizona. You said 120,000 acres? Yes, John, it's one of the big ranches of the West uh, nowadays. This will give you an idea of the main ranch house and some of the bunk buildings. The cattle roam all over the ranges. Also, some bands of wild horses. These shots of the wild horses were made with telephoto lenses and we couldn't get too close to them. Dee gets acquainted with Mr. Colby, our host. Also with some of the horses. Mr. Colby shows us his brand, the Rail X, which is one of 80,000 registered brands in the state of Arizona. This old boy, Manuel, is probably the oldest cowboy on any ranch in Arizona today. He's been on the Rail X for 50 years or more. These are typical cowboys, not the Hollywood variety. You can see how they're dressed. These boys dress and work and eat the real cowboy life. I don't even see any guitars. No, I don't think any <laughs> of these boys could sing. Of course, so this is one of the most important implements on any ranch, the big coffee pot. The mornings are cold over there, even during the summertime. So the coffee pot is quite valuable. Of course, the ranch cookie, who at one time was a chef in a New York hotel and decided to come west, teaches Dee some of the intricacies of Western cooking. Well, this is a switch from crepe Suzettes to flapjacks, eh? <laughs> the switch was very good, John. The uh -huh. food was wonderful. Even the cookie thought so, and with good reason. Beans and stew, and again, the hot coffee. One of the gallant cowboys is helping Dee, who has her hands full. Manuel is stoking up before he sets off for the daily chores. On the ranch, John, are the ruins of old Fort Buchanan. You've seen in the movies where the cavalry rides out to rescue the settlers. Uh-huh. Well, the cavalry actually came from this fort and others like it in the southwest. This post, which was built back in about 1844 or 45, to keep the Mescalero Apaches from murdering the white settlers. Then during the Civil War, when the cavalry were recalled to the eastern part of the country, the Mescalero Apaches overran this fort and demolished it. 
there are many menaces to cattle in the western ranges, mountain lions and coyotes, particularly coyotes who prey on young calves. So Mr. Colby and Manuel have decided to track down one of the marauding coyotes and put him out of business. And Manuel, of course, is a terrific tracker, and it takes very little time until he's located the quarry up on a jagged peak, and he quickly dispatches them. Before the actual roundup, Dee and I decided to take a little hike up and see what other wildlife we could find. There are lots of animals there, and among the things we saw was this chucker partridge. There are mountain lions and coyotes and foxes and squirrels of all kinds through here. And there are other animals here, quite dangerous animals. Whoops, steady there, Mr. Hathcock. <laughs> well, you have to be quite careful in climbing around these mountains because they are full of rattlesnakes. That was a close call and it made us even more cautious. This dog, who just seemed to attach himself to us, probably lives at one of the ranches in the territory there, but we don't know which one. But he had a lot of fun following us. Why, well, isn't this a vista? It's beautiful country, John. Very wild, still very rugged. The water flowing down out of those mountains, what streams there are, is ice cold, very refreshing. But I decided to relax and have a stogie, and then a little later, take a snooze and dream of wild Indians riding the range and thousands of cattle in the sky. Thank you, Mr. Hathcock. Part two of the Roundup continues in just, in just a moment. The Roundup wasn't quite ready to go, so we have a little surprise for you. We decided to take off to Okeen, Oklahoma on another Roundup, a rattlesnake Roundup. A what? Rattlesnakes. Oh, wait a minute. I heard of roundups, but never rattlestick. <laughs> well, this is one, John, that takes place every year in western Oklahoma. The country is pretty well overrun with dens of rattlesnakes. And more than a thousand people, sometimes as many as two or three thousand people, come from all over the United States to get in on this roundup. Now, this lady is holding a citation for bravery for anyone who participates in the roundup. You have to register and you get a safari card, uh, which costs one dollar and entitles you to take part in the roundup. Everyone who comes over to take part in it has his own idea of what constitutes the right kind of a snake hook. However, I have seen these people at various times actually reach down with their bare hands and grab rattlesnakes. Luckily, very few of them are ever bitten. This is a big day, isn't it? It certainly is. As you can see, this is rather rugged country, too. This mm -hmm. is gypsum hill country, full of rock cracks and fissures, and the snakes hibernate in there during the winter by the thousands. Then in the early spring, they come out of the dens and they lie around in the warm sun for a week or two before they crawl off into the surrounding country. This is a mountain boomer, a lizard, one of the other reptiles of the area. You have to move cautiously because the hills are alive with rattlesnakes at this time of year. Do you have to look for these boys or are they... Uh... Well, no, you locate a den and you may find them in the open such as this one or you may find them lying under some brush. These snakes are more poisonous at this time of year than at any other time. They've been denned up all winter, they haven't eaten, they haven't expended their venom on anything, so it is quite potent and they have lots of it. But as you said earlier, they're just out of hibernation, so they're rather listless. At this time of year, they're still a little cold, uh -huh. and uh, they don't move too well, although you can't depend on that. Mr. Hathcock, can those snakes climb up that sack? They could, John, except that they twist the neck of the sack tight so that the snake cannot crawl back up and bite you in the hand. Uh -huh. now, some of these fellows get a little eager and a little incautious, such as this fella, and sometimes, as will happen in the best of regulated families, someone is bitten but there's first aid handy, and there's never been any fatalities on these hunts, John, so if you want to come along, there wouldn't be too much danger. <laughs> no, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Incidentally, if you are bitten on this roundup, you become a member of the White Fang Club. <laughs> a dubious honor at best. These are Western Diamondbacks. Some of them are three and four feet in length, and a few of the old ones reach maybe six or six and a half feet. Other than doing away with a menace, is there any other reason for this? Yes, most of the snakes are sold to zoos, to museums, and to colleges for study. I see. 
Their venoms are extracted and used in the treatment of excessive bleeding and epilepsy and several other things. So there is a good scientific reason for collecting these as well as the fun involved. They dump them out of the bags and put them into boxes for safer handling while they take them back into town. After the roundup is over, all of the snakes are brought into one central area and they weigh these rattlesnakes and they're sold at 50 cents a pound. Also, some people take these and make beautiful trophies out of them for dens. This is about a six or six and a half foot skin. And some of the fellows have collected some coach whip snakes and blue racers, which are very beneficial snakes in that they eat mice and other vermin. Now, they'll take these home to their ranches and their farms and turn them loose. These fellows must have grown up with these snakes as boys, don't you Well, think? most of them have. They weigh these snakes, and the average snake probably weighs from a pound and a half to three pounds. Some of the larger ones may reach uh, 15 pounds in weight. Well, Mr. Hathcock, aren't the people a little afraid of the snakes getting loose in this crowd? Well, no, John, they're pretty well corralled by the fellows who have hunted them and know how to handle them. On this particular hunt, there were over 2,500 rattlesnakes captured. Now, this is the number that is usually collected each year, around 2,500 to 3,000 snakes. And this hunt has been going on for years, and still the snakes don't seem to be any scarcer than they ever were. <laughs> well, we've completed our little rattlesnake roundup, so it's back to Arizona to the cattle roundup. We arrived at the Rail X just about in time to find the cowboys readying their horses and their saddles and getting all set to go out on the ranges. Now this pinto is Manuel's favorite, so we decided to show you exactly how they shoe a horse there. They tear off the old shoe, they file down the hoof, which does not in any way injure the horse or hurt it, then they nail on the new shoe. Now these horses are not injured, they don't even feel this because that hoof is very much like a fingernail. And of course they wear the brush pants or chaps because they're gonna be working in chaparral and thorn bush, spooking the cattle out and they want to protect their legs. And these old boys are expert at putting the blankets on and the saddles because there's only one way to do it, and that's the right way. Well, how many roundups are there a year, Mr. Hathcock? There are two, John. There's a spring roundup, such as this one, and a fall roundup. Mm -hmm. Most of the cowboys have already gone out on the range to various places to start driving the cattle in. This last group, Dee and I accompanied over on the northern part of the range to bring in part of the trail herd. I bet this is a pretty brisk morning. It was very cold, and Dee was all bundled up like an Indian squaw there with a blanket on. There they are, range cattle. The cattle were bawling and calling to each other as they were running up and down these gullies. With all this acreage Mr. Colby has here, how do you know where to start looking for the cattle in a roundup like this? Well, you just look all over, John, because they're found all over, but generally around where there's some water. In driving the cattle, we scare up a lot of deer as we drive through these arroyos and ravines. This one almost ran into the camera before she saw me and took off in another direction. And uh, a little later, Dee has heard it bawling up on a hillside. There's a little calf lost up on a promontory. Dee, being the motherly type, she's taken off to locate him and try to rescue him before the coyotes get to it. Manuel, to make sure she doesn't get in trouble, has gone along with her. So they've made the big rescue. <laughs> the range has several windmills which pump water up for the cattle. And it's around these places generally that the big herds are found and driven up through the draws. And approximately how many head of cattle does Mr. Colby have here? At this time, he was running about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 head of cattle. And a couple of them decided to battle it out for supremacy of the herd. These old boys were really going at it. You could hear those heads crack for a long ways. They weigh around 1,400 pounds, these two bulls, and that's uh, a lot of bull. <laughs> They're bringing the cattle out of the brush back into the ranch, into the various corrals, where the little boys will be separated from the little girls, and the rancher will decide which cattle are to become beef cattle and which will become milk cattle or breeding stock. And, of course, the roundup consists of dehorning these cattle, which, again, in no way hurts them at all. It scares them a little bit, but doesn't hurt them. And they put a brand on them. 
That's because an unbranded calf or cow on the range is a maverick, and anyone can claim it. And that's how the brands originated, so that each stock runner would know which cattle were his. It takes several days, John, to separate the ones that they're going to brand. I was going to say, a roundup is not only a big physical job, but also an organizational job. It certainly is. It's quite a job. Everything has to go off at the right time and the right place. The cowboys go out into the brush and bring in the mesquite and the greasewood to make the fires. Greasewood makes a terrifically hot fire, and that's what they need for the brands. Now, this is the Rail X brand, one of the oldest in Arizona. Then they lay the rope on the calves that they're going to brand. Now, they don't injure this animal in any way because an injured animal is no good to the owner. It's just dead stock, and they're very careful with these calves. Then the next step here is to put the pig and string on it, or they tie up the calf. And I'm sure that the branding doesn't hurt them. This is the brand on the calf. And they're branded only once in their lifetime. That's right. And then after the branding, they're turned back into the hills. Now, thank you, Mr. Hathcock. Now, the last time you were with us, I introduced you as a man with a rich background, a man who's held down many jobs. Let's see, you were a reporter, a prize fighter, a private eye. What were some of the others? Well, I've collected wild animals for zoos, among other things. And I think you also said something about being a cow puncher at one time. Would well, you elaborate? Actually, it was only for about a year on the Flying V Ranch back in Oklahoma, John. I see. Do you think the cowboy will ever become extinct? In other words, do you think he'll ever be replaced by modern machinery? No, I don't think so, John, because uh, although we have uh, electrical milking equipment and uh, uh, electrified feed bins that sort out the food for the cattle, uh, I know that no machine is ever going to be able to bushwhack the cattle out of the canyons and off the hills and to uh, bulldog them and uh, brand them. It takes a cowboy. Now, we saw some pretty wonderfully authentic scenes of a roundup, of branding, of bulldogging. Now, obviously, this is very rough on a cowboy, but uh, what about the poor calf or the steer? Does this bother him any? No, I don't think so, John. Those animals are very sturdy. As a matter of fact, uh, here is a branding iron, and although this may hurt for a moment, uh, I'm sure that it doesn't hurt the cattle half as much as uh, tattooing hurts human beings. Well, this is the first branding iron we've had on our program. Can we give our audience a look at this? Yes. That's from the famous J.A. Ranch in Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, how many brands are there in the state of Arizona? Well, actually, there are more than 80,000 registered brands in the state of Arizona. It seems incredible, doesn't it? Is the Rail X a dude ranch or is it a working ranch? Well, let me put it this way, John. It would be impossible for a hotel to exist uh, out there like that. So all of these ranches are working ranches. Uh, however, the Rail X is one of the finest dude ranches in the West also. Well, we also saw some wonderful films of Indians in your picture. Now, you said the Indians are prospering. What did you mean by that? I meant particularly the uh, Navajos. You see, the, uh, the government a long time ago uh, put these people into what they thought was worthless country. And uh, recently, some of the greatest deposits of uranium have been found there. And these Indians are now uh, uh, living high off of the hog. At one time, they had oil wells, and now it's uranium, of all things. Well, of course, not all the Indians are prospering, but uh, at least the Navajos are. Well, Mr. Hathcock, I'd like to thank you once again for this colorful episode of our own great outdoors. We'll certainly be looking forward to your next appearance in our program. And please remember us to Mrs. Hathcock. I certainly will, John. And best thank of you. good luck to the both of you. This is the quest. 64 feet of sleek sailing speed underway in the fabulous ocean race to French Tahiti. Her skipper is Dr. Howard Murphy of Beverly Hills, who will be with us in person to present his films of this exciting race, the longest and most grueling race in the world today. The crew, young and old alike, they have one thing in common, a love of sailing the open sea in fair competition come what may. The 5,000 miles go by very fast. There's something that must be done every minute on a sailing craft. In Tahiti, it's a royal welcome for all hands and a chance to relax in this South Sea paradise. Enjoy it all next week in The Race to Tahiti. For those of you who may have motion picture films of a journey anywhere in the world, here are the technical film requirements to keep in mind in writing to our program. The film must be 16 millimeter, black and white or color, and photographed at 24 frames per second. We're not able to use slides or still photographs. Now, until next week, John Stevenson saying thank you and good night.